Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We'll start in just a moment. I think we're in a good place. People are just signing in right now. Okay, I've just sent out the sources that I sent on the invitation, but somebody just requested them. Okay, on that happy note, we're up to part three of our three-part series on Judaism and, human and humanity within the biblical world. First week, we talked about chosen people and all of that. Second one, we talked about uh, the Ger Toshav, the resident alien and his or her role within biblical Israel and the values that we could learn from that. And today we move on to the Messianic era. The Messianic era represents the ideal this is how the prophets envision a future world. So the question is, what will be the relationship between Israel and the nations in that future idealized world? Okay, so that's our goal. And we're going to take several texts, some of which are pretty straightforward and a few of which we've even seen in, in the first two sessions. But then a few others draw a lot, of, a lot of debate among the rabbis who try to figure out what are the precise parameters of what the Israel-humanity relationship should be in this idealized future. So without further ado, we will begin with source number one. The prophet Svanya lived in the 7th century BCE. He prophesied during the reign of the very righteous king Josiah or Yoshiahu. And generally speaking, he hated the world that he lived in, both in Israel and in the world. He thought that the world was basically corrupt, needed to be removed, and we need to have a lot of shepherds. That's his basic mission. He thought that city life was a disaster leading to arrogance, immorality, all kinds of terrible things. So he calls for the downfall of basically Israel and the rest of the world, the surrounding area. But then at the end of his book, it's only three chapters long, he has an idealized picture of what the future will look like. And one of the verses is source number one, for then I will make the peoples pure of speech, that they all invoke the Lord by name and serve him with one accord. In the future, everybody will be united, everybody will serve God again, and then, of course, things will be much better, as the rest of the prophecy goes on to say. There actually are a couple of commentators, including very prominent ones like Ibn Ezra and Radak, who understand that Svanya, that Svanya is prophesying that people will speak in Hebrew. And when it says pure speech, it actually will be a unified language. The Hebrew, in, the Hebrew for this is Safa Berura. And they actually understand that everybody will suddenly run to Ulpan, and before you know it, they'll all speak a perfect Hebrew, which is amazing. The dominant view of our commentators is not that. If you just read the, the verse, it doesn't sound like it's about one language, meaning one spoken language, but rather the language of service of God. And that's how most of our commentators take it. That's how Rambam, Maimonides takes it. That's how the overwhelming preponderance of our commentators through the eras have understood this. And it's a religious transformation rather than a specific language spoken language issue. And the idea is that everybody will finally serve God. They will eliminate their paganism, their immorality, and all the other terrible things that need to, need to disappear. A Barbanel is the one who connected this prophecy, just this verse alone is enough to do that, connected this prophecy with the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, which is all the way back in Genesis chapter 11, at least the way I understand the story, and this follows the classic rabbinic opinion, but I think that they, they're spot on on this one, and that requires its own class to, to navigate, but we'll do it some other time, uh, is about how the world, there was a rupture between God and humanity at that moment. The whole world was united, and they were turning to idolatry, just terrible arrogance, idolatry, and terrible things, as the sages already say, and I believe that that's probably the best way to read the story in, the contextual, in its contextual meaning. So two things happened. One is the nations turned to idolatry, and the other one is they actually had different languages. They were no longer united. Right? Those are the two consequences of that story. A Barbanel understands our prophecy here in Svanya to be the antidote to both of those dimensions. They'll now speak one unified language. They will serve God. The humanity will once again be united. So the Tower of Babel no longer will be in the world but in, in a metaphorical sense, but rather we're going to have one united humanity. So, so far, so good. The rupture that existed between God and humanity from the early period in human history will finally be eliminated. That's part one. Part two, source number two. 
Isaiah chapter 2 this is already a very celebrated passage, not just because it's on the wall, uh, Isaiah wall at the United Nations, but it, it's, it's, a worthy, it's a worthy passage to, to be that celebrated. In the days to come, the mount of the Lord's house shall stand firm above the mountains and tower above the hills, and all the nations shall gaze on it with joy. So in some future period, what you and I would call the messianic utopian era, all the nations of the world will, will turn to the temple mount. And the many people shall go and say, come, let us go up to the mount of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For instruction shall come forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. All the nations of the world will come flocking to Jerusalem. They'll come to the temple. They'll want to serve God. Thus he will judge among the nations and arbitrate for the many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not take up sword against nation. They shall never again know war. This passage takes for granted that all God-fearing people are welcome to the temple. Right? That there will be, there will be a united humanity living in harmony. And that they're looking to the people of Israel as role models, that the people of Israel have done such a good job in modeling the Torah, that now all these nations want to live the Torah in some form. Most of our commentators understand this does not mean that they will convert to Judaism, although they would be welcome to, but rather that they will accept the seven Noahide law as a basic religious ethical lifestyle with whatever twist they put on that, but they will be welcome to the temple once they are that, once they serve God alone and they are ethical. So from this perspective, Svanya and Isaiah are very much in sync. Now we're dealing with a unified humanity, not because they're all Jewish, but rather just because they're all religious ethical, and as a result, they genuinely can all get along and serve God in the temple. So far, so good, and not really very much controversy. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, when we discussed the chosen people, we raised the, in passing, we raised one other issue, which is, are Jews, according to the Torah, obligated to proselytize to the whole world? Given that we're supposed to be this chosen nation that teaches, are we supposed to actually bring this message to everybody in the world? Are we supposed to go out and open up missions in every country on the globe with the hope of teaching the seven Noahide laws to people? It's a very interesting question. The Bible does not give an unequivocal answer to that, but I will say that my impression is that, no, we don't, op we don't need to open up missions all over the world. That never was the intent of the Bible at all. But rather, we're supposed to exemplify what the Torah represents, and that will serve as a model to everybody else. Sorry, somebody had a... Okay, just a, just a mute button malfunction. In the meantime, uh, and th this position seems to go back to source number three already in the Torah. Generally speaking, God demands of the people of Israel to keep the commandments, and that's because God and Israel have a unique covenantal relationship with obligations and agreements. And the obligations include the laws of the Torah. Very straightforward. There's one place where God gives a different motivator why the people of Israel should keep the Torah, and that is because they will serve as a model to the world, and that means that the laws must be comprehensible. So source three, see, I have imparted to you laws and rules as the Lord my God has commanded me, Moshe is the speaker here, for you to abide by in the land that you are about to enter and occupy. Observe them faithfully, for that will be proof of your wisdom and discernment to other peoples, who on hearing of all these laws will say, surely that great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what great nation is there that has a God so close at hand, as is the Lord our God whenever we call upon him? Or what great nation has laws and rules as perfect as all this teaching that I set before you this day? This is the one place in the Torah where it's taken for granted that the laws of the Torah are comprehensible to somebody else. They're not just hocus pocus laws that Jews must keep because God said so. But rather the assumption is that if people see us observing these laws, they will be impressed. They must be comprehensible to others. This passage is something that Rambam, Maimonides, plays up big time in his Guide for the Perplex, of the Perplexed, by the way, where he, he focuses on the, the commandments must have a rationale that makes sense to intelligent human beings, even those who are not observant Jews. It can't just be arbitrary decrees. It must be that they are sensible and good because God expects that other nations will also be impressed. Okay, so he actually cites this exact passage. This passage seems to lie at the heart of the prophetic vision. The prophets, more often than not, are yelling at the people of Israel to improve their society. And then they envision, when you do this, all the nations of the world will be impressed. That seems to be the underlying philosophy of Isaiah chapter 2 as well. So, so far, so good. Svanya prophesies that the nations of the world will abandon their idolatry and immorality and abandon the Tower of Babel in the 
you know, in the metaphorical sense and come back to pure God worship, Isaiah reminds everybody that all God-fearing people are welcome to the temple. There's, it's not about Jews and non-Jews. Everybody's welcome to serve God in the temple because the temple belongs to humanity, okay? Now, the third passage that we're going to look at, which is source number four, is in Isaiah 56. Now, the talk of discrimination in every society, even in a good society, is a productive conversation. It's sad that we always need to have these conversations, but there's been discrimination is as old as humanity itself. The Torah tried to fight that by insisting that all people are one family that are all created in God's image. But the biases of all the pagan nations that evolved into the nations that are around today were powerful. And the idea that one people is superior in some form or another to another people is something that is very well attested throughout the annals of human history. Unfortunately, some of these attitudes sometimes infected the Jewish people too. Right? There's no question that there were Jews who were very discriminatory. And we see record of that in the prophetic canon in source number four over here, where the prophet has to say very emphatically, let not the foreigner say who has attached himself to the Lord, the Lord will keep me apart from his people. And let not the eunuch say, I am a withered tree. For thus said the Lord, as for the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who have chosen what I desire and hold fast to my covenant, I will give them in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons or daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which shall not perish. First of all, you can attain immor immortality also. As for the foreigners who attach themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord and to be his, ser to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and who hold fast to my covenant, I will bring them to my sacred mount and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices shall be welcome on my altar, for my house shall be called the house of prayer for all peoples. So the question here is, who is getting that invitation to the temple? God is insistent that whoever is in this paragraph is more than welcome to come. So several commentators think that this is a reference to righteous converts, people who were born non-Jewish who became Jewish. They are welcome to the temple and they should never feel any sense of discrimination or exclusion within the people of Israel. This is the view of Rashi and Radak and others as well. However, Ibn Ezra and Rabbi Eliezer of Belgian Sea and several others disagree. The opening verse in verse three is about the foreigner. It's not about a righteous convert. It's about somebody who's what you and I would call not Jewish, somebody who is a Gentile who wants to come serve God, but is faithful to God. And unfortunately they felt excluded from the temple. So the prophet reminds them very insistently, no, you're welcome to the temple too. This vision goes back to King Solomon's vision when he opened the temple in the first place. In source number five, he makes very clear the temple was never built exclusively for the people of Israel. Or if a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land for the sake of your name, for they shall hear about your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes to pray toward this house, oh, here in your heavenly abode and grant all that the foreigner asks you for. Thus all the peoples of the earth will know your name and revere you as does your people Israel, and they will recognize that your name is attached to this house that I have built. King Solomon, when he opened the temple and was giving this dedication prayer, made clear this temple belongs to all God-fearing people. That was always the vision of the temple. It never was intended just for the people of Israel. It was intended for all God-fearing people to be able to serve the one God. And so what Isaiah predicted in in source number two, in, in chapter two, with all the nations of the world coming to the temple, is a perfectly normal outcome of what King Solomon is talking about. What source number four is about, the prophecy in source number four is about, is that people, non-Jews, who serve God felt excluded. There's no question that some Jews seem to have discriminated against them and said, you don't belong here. So the prophet is saying, no, that's not our vision. Our vision is that God-fearing people serve God in the temple. And so, so far, all the sources that we've seen are completely in sync. Let's take a break and look at the red heifer. Yes, very good. That's considered one of the most incomprehensible laws, and you're for sure correct. But Rambam's principle was you can learn some humanly meaningful thing from every law. It's keeping the Sabbath a righteous deed for non-Jews, not in halacha. This goes back to our class from last week, that the Ger Tzedek, the resident alien, is obligated to keep Shabbat according to the Torah. Halakha doesn't codify it that way. Halakha turns the ger into the ger tzedek, the convert. And a convert is certainly obligated to keep Shabbat, just like any born Jew. And suddenly the ger toshav, the resident alien, is not obligated under most halakhic rulings to keep Shabbat. So the prophet, this prophecy here in Sefer Yeshayahu in the book of Isaiah is not addressing the halakhic terminology. It's addressing the, what you and I would call the non-Jew living in Israel. 
So according to prophecy following the Torah, such individuals are more than welcome to come to the temple and even would be keeping the Shabbat as a sign of their connection to God without becoming what you and I would call Jewish. Okay, so, so far so good. Now we enter one of the more interesting passages, which is the last chapter of the book of Isaiah. It's source number six, but first we're going to take a water break because boy, oh boy, controversy coming. Here's where all of you grammar and writing teachers are going to nail it right away. Or anybody with that sort of bias will also nail this right away. The prophet says, out of all the nations, this is source six now, said the Lord, they shall bring, they equals non-Jews who are coming to learn about the glory of God. That's just the context from this chapter. They shall bring all your brothers on horses. So your brothers refers to people of Israel. And the idea is that the, this is the ingathering of the exiles. So far, cool. That's not where the controversy lies, okay? In chariots and drays, on mules and dromedaries, to Jerusalem, my holy mountain, in, as an offering to the Lord. Just as the Israelites bring an offering in a pure vessel to the house of the Lord. Okay, so this is, sounds very similar. That Jews and non-Jews alike, now serving God, will serve God in the temple. No controversy there. And from them, likewise, I will take some of them to be Levitical priests, said the Lord. Who is the from them? Who exactly is becoming a Kohen? Who's becoming a priest from them? This is a Haftarah that we recite actually every Shabbat Rosh Chodesh. It's a fairly frequently recited passage, but I, I don't remember ever jumping out during a synagogue reading and saying, whoa, how could he say that? Like who's from them? Who exactly is going to serve as a priest in this temple, in this future temple? So them could refer to the non-Jews who are bringing the Jews from exile or it can refer to those Jews who are being brought from exile, right? Those are the two subjects in the previous verse. And so you understand that the them, this is where the writing teachers would kick in and say, you gotta clarify. Okay, so the prophet didn't, so that leaves our commentators up in the air about who's the them. Okay, so you have a debate. This is a very important rabbinic debate. But before we get to that debate, you have to understand in Torah law, there is a severe prohibition of anybody who's not from the house of Aaron to serve in the temple as priests. Nobody else is allowed to, not born Jews, not converts, not, not Ger Tzedek, not Ger Toshav, not non-Jews, nobody else. Only the tribe of Levi and specifically the, the Aaronite priests. Somebody just has to hit mute and then we'll be much better. But in, again, if, you're, if you feel that somehow you're not on mute, please do something about it. Thank you. Okay, otherwise, answer your phone. So that, that all being said, uh, there's a severe prohibition. And just ask Korach and all of his gang. They rebelled against Moshe and the Torah. They wanted to be priests. They performed some of the service, and they didn't last very long, right? And the Torah very emphatically legislates. This is a law, a series of laws. So it should be that nobody else can serve in the temple except for born priests, people who just happen to be from the Aharon line, from the Aaron line. And that is exactly how Rashi and several others understand this passage. When it says, from them, likewise, I will take some to be Levitical priests, the them refers to the Jews in the previous verse. And more specifically, of those Jews who were brought back from exile, some of them happened to be Kohanim. So the innovation of this prophecy, according to Rashi and those who follow him, is that even though some of these priests, Jewish priests, may have sinned while they were in exile, God will accept their repentance and allow them to serve. And that's all that the prophet is saying here. Not that non-Jews will serve in the temple, that the from them refers to people who by their birth are allowed to serve in the temple and God will simply accept their, for their repentance. Okay, let's just read the comments for a moment. The person is not Shemir Shabbat, it seems that they're unwelcome in the temple. That is the implication, that is correct. It sounds very much that, sounds very much like the, one of the basic responsibilities of a resident alien in the Torah is to keep Shabbat. That's a basic law of the land. And those who are disrespectful of that law of the land, in fact, would be barred from, keep, from going to the temple. That seems to be correct. Then refers to Jews. What does the likewise mean? That is a very good question. It doesn't seem like it fits so well. But all the same, that's how Rashi learns the verse. Rashi says that the from them refers to from among the Jews who were returning from exile, those who were Kohanim, those who were actually genetically priests are the ones who will serve God in the temple. Okay, so that's option A, which is, again, is Rashi's view and others follow, follow his view as well. A second view is that of Radak's father, Rabbi Joseph Kimchi. I just have to get this back to everyone. Hang on. Who 
who lived in the 12th century Provence. He was a fabulous Tanakh teacher. The only reason he's not so famous is because his son, Rabbi David Kimki, Radak, became so much greater. His son simply outshone his father and for that matter, his older brother, who also was excellent at Tanakh. But Radak is certainly of the three considered the greatest and he's the one who made it into the canon of traditional rabbinic commentary on the Bible. But Rabbi Joseph Kimchi, Radak quotes his father, Rabbi David Kimchi quotes his father, Rabbi Joseph Kimchi, who says the from them refers to non-Jews, that non-Jews will serve in the temple, but not as priests. They will serve as the attendants of the priests. They will assist them. And he brings precedent from Tanakh itself, from the Bible itself. If you look at sources seven and eight, there's a long history of what we would call today non-Jews serving in temple roles, but not in the priestly ones, but rather as attendants. It goes back to the time of Joshua. He made a treaty with a city of Givon, a Canaanite city of Givon. The Givonites fooled Joshua and the people of Israel into thinking that they were from some distant land. So Joshua made a treaty with them, and after he realized who they were, he allowed these Canaanites, who obviously must have converted at some basic minimum, they abandoned their idolatry and were at decent people now, they served in the temple. And that's source number seven. That day, Joshua made them hewers of wood and drawers of water, as they still are, for the community and for the altar of the Lord in the place that he would choose. The book of Joshua reports that Joshua made these givonim, not only slaves for the people of Israel, but rather servants in the shrine, which at that time was the tabernacle. And this was an acceptable form of service. And likewise, all the way at the, end of this, at the end of the Bible, the other side, in the book of Ezra, in source number eight, and of the temple servants whom David and the officers had appointed for the service of the Levites, 220 temple servants, the Hebrew is nitinim, all of them listed by name. These also are understood to be what we would call non-Jews who served in the temple in, in attending roles. They were assistants to the Kohanim and to the Levim, but they did not do the job of the Kohanim and Levim because, of course, they're not allowed to. So when it says in the verses, from them I will take to be Levitical priests, it doesn't mean really that they will be priests. It means that they will serve the priests and help them in, the, in, the, in that role. Okay, let's go back over to the comments for a second. It seems like from them I will take these mincha gifts to give to the priests. That's, that is what it sounds like. So Rabbi Joseph Kumki is a better read, read in that sense, that it's referring to non-Jews, but specifically referring to non-Jews who serve in the temple. Please mention that we have an obligation to bring back Jews that converted to other religions. Amen. I completely correct. All good. Next. That's different from proselytizing, which is what we were talking about before, dealing with outright people who are non-Jewish. What is our obligation toward them? The answer does not seem to be to convert them, not forget about not to Judaism, but not even to Noahide laws, but rather to set a model that will inspire them to do so. As well as foreign help and foreign wood, that might have had symbolic value. I completely agree. There's no question that non-Jews were in from the get-go, and this is simply a piece of that puzzle. I agree. So that's that. There's one other view that is out there, and that is Rabbi Amos Chacham, who wrote the Dat Mikra commentary in the 20th century. Again, let me just write that. Oops, sorry about the U at the end of that word. I did not mean that. He thinks it also refers to non-Jews. That, this, that the prophet is talking about how non-Jews will be chosen as priests, but it doesn't mean, don't take that literally. The idea is non-Jews will bring Jews back from the exile to celebrate the glory of God, and they will serve God in the temple by bringing sacrifices. God will consider that sacrifice as though they were priests, which is certainly not the smoothest reading of the text, but all the same, he's, he's doing what everybody else is trying to do. Our traditional commentators have a very difficult time with the possibility that our prophet is saying that anybody other than people from Aaron's descent, descendants will serve as real priests in the temple, right? The, the one way of reading this verse, that cannot be right. The prophet's not going to contradict a law in the Torah. That is the running assumption of all three camps that we've discussed, Rashi, Rabbi Joseph, Kimchi, and Amos Chacham. So they come up with different strategies of how to manage that. According to, Rad, to Rashi, what we're looking at is Jews will be chosen by God to serve as, in, as priests, specifically those Jews who are born Kohanim. Uh, according to Rabbi Joseph Kimchi, non-Jews are going to be chosen to serve as attendants to the priests. And according to Amos Chacham, non-Jews will be chosen because of their service in the temple, because they're bringing sacrifices, but not that they will actually serve as Kohanim. If, for the record, this prophecy does say that 
uh, non-Jews can serve as priests in the temple. This would be entirely unprecedented in the rest of the Bible, and again, against the laws of the Torah itself. So that would be a remarkable conclusion to reach, which is what motivates all the commentators that we've discussed, and many, many others as well, to reinterpret something in this passage to match what we understand to be the law. Okay, but this passage is certainly the most far reaching that we've seen so far, where at least there's a suggestion, whether or not that's the proper meaning, that non Jews may serve as priests in the future temple in the Messianic era, which is remarkable if that's what he means. And if not, okay, so we have these modified ways of reading the passage that we have seen. Let's move on to source number nine. I think I mentioned this two weeks ago in the Chosen People class, so let's look at it again. In that day, there shall be several towns in the land of Egypt, speaking the, lang the language of Canaan and swearing loyalty to the Lord of hosts. One shall be called the town of Cheres. In that day, there shall be an altar to the Lord inside the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. So it sounds like the idea is that one day, non-Jews, specifically those living in Egypt, will serve God. In that day, Israel shall be a third partner with Egypt and Assyria as a blessing on earth. But the Lord of hosts will bless them, saying, Blessed be my people Egypt, my handiwork Assyria, and my very own Israel. So what's interesting, by the way, is that this is the only place in the entire Tanakh, in the entire Bible, that any other nation outside of Israel is called my nation, that God refers to some other nation as my nation. So the simple reading of the verse is, it tells you what we discussed two weeks ago. Those non-Jewish nations or individuals that serve God properly, normally understood to be through the seven Noahide laws, basic modicum of monotheism and ethical behavior, those people, in fact, are chosen people. God would immediately accept them as chosen people also. And what we discussed two weeks ago is the thesis that you are chosen according to the Bible when you choose God. For the people of Israel, that means keeping the entire covenant, the, the commandments, the mitzvot. When it comes to non-Jews, it means keeping the seven Noahide laws. But in both cases, those who choose God in those ways, in fact, become chosen. And that's what this passage seems to suggest outright. Most of our commentators hear that, but they don't like it. It seems a little too equal. And so they come up with different strategies of how to deflect the equality that seems to emerge from this read, from the passage the way that it seems to read. Uh, Rashi adopts some Midrashic readings and completely reorients this verse. Rather than saying that the idea is that every nation that chooses God is chosen, what it Rashi reads the verse as though it says, let's look at 25 again, for the Lord of hosts will bless them, saying, Blessed be my people, who am I redeemed from Egypt? In other words, it refers only to Israel, exclusively to Israel. My, my handiwork is Syria doesn't mean blessed be, blessed be Assyria, but rather, blessed be my nation, Israel, from whom I saved from the Assyrians, and then my beloved nation, Israel. So really, according to Rashi and those who follow him, all of this verse refers exclusively to a righteous Israel, and they should be blessed. Okay, let's just now let's take a break and look at the sides. Hold on. I mean, non Jews will bring Jews back home, they'll sponsor flights, drive them out of exile with anti Semitism. Uh, the first one, the, the flight one, it's not about persecution. The non Jews who are bringing the Jews back home are friends, they're people who recognize God, want to learn more about God. So on their way to Israel, they say, Hey, Jews, come with us. It's a friendly invitation. It's not a persecution thing. Okay. My understanding is that Judaism was a major proselytizing religion until the zenith of the Roman Empire, when many idol worshippers, unhappy with their established religion, were very attracted to the ethics and morality of Noahic laws. The most found kashrut and circumcision too much. Hence the appeal of the new religion, Christianity. Then the Jewish proselytization was sharply reduced. That is historically true, or so it seems. There certainly are records that support exactly this type of approach. Hang on. There's still no obligation in the Bible to go out and proselytize. It's not clear whether the Jews had an active mission or whether it, they simply attracted converts. There's no question that you're right that they attracted converts in the, you know, the early centuries of the Christian era. But the question is, were they actively doing it because they thought the Bible itself taught them that? Not at all clear. But in fact, you're right. There, there were those who became, you know, became Jews or at least thought about converting to Judaism as because of the attraction of the religion. Can anyone imagine that Haredi in Borough Park, Jerusalem would ever give access to anyone but themselves to the temple? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to get into particular groups. All I can tell you is that in 
the time of Isaiah chapter 56 that we saw a couple of sources ago, there obviously was discrimination against God-fearing non-Jews coming to the temple then. We already see it in the Bible itself, that there were those Jews who viewed this very unfavorably and said, this is our temple. And the prophet has to come and say, uh, it is your temple, but it's everybody's temple. It belongs to the world. It belongs to humanity. And this all reflects the God-human God relationship rather than exclusively the God-Israel relationship. Uh, assuming non-Jews, by whatever definition, are welcome to the temple or modern day synagogue, should they not wear talit or tefillin, even if motivated to do so? Interesting question about what the should is. They're certainly not obligated to, according to Jewish law. And, you know, the question is, may they if they want to? I don't see why not. And, in fact, no synagogue would ask them, are they Jewish or not? Right? So if they show up, non-Jews show up and wear talit and tefillin, I'm sure that they could. There's no prohibition against it. All the same, they're certainly not obligated. No sorry... Oops, disregard. Okay, consider it disregarded. Everything is cool. Okay, let's get back to source number nine. We saw Rashi's view that there's nothing about any other nation being chosen. It's all about Israel. However, there are those who understand that the verse doesn't say that. The verse actually says, in verse again, verse 25 in source nine, but the Lord of hosts will bless them, saying, blessed be my people Egypt, my handiwork Assyria, and my very own Israel. It sounds very, very much, it sounds very, very much that all three nations can be chosen. And that is the reading of Ibn Ezra, Radak, and Amos Chacham, each in, their own, each in his own way. Ibn Ezra and Radak essentially say the same general point, which is, yes, all three nations, Egypt, Assyria, and Israel, will be chosen nations once they all choose God. But Israel is better because of the third, the Hebrew is Nachalati, my inheritance, which our JPS here translates as my very own Israel. So they understand it basically like that also, that Israel represents a much more beloved connection to God than the other nations. So even though all nations will be chosen by God, there's a sharp distinction between Israel and the nations and that God views Israel as his beloved people. Uh, Amos Chacham, alternatively, learns a little, little, little bit different. He understands the verse doesn't really say that. The verse really equates the three nations. But he says, look, Israel is mentioned last in the climactic position because they're still the best. And okay, could be. But it also could be that the whole point of this passage is to say that all nations can become God's people if they choose God. And that seems to be the smoothest reading of this text in, in Isaiah 19. And that, that's what matters, that, that in fact, the prophet is not distinguishing between Israel and the nations or giving Israel a leg up. The whole point is that all people who choose God are now God's people. Okay. Okay, so let's go back over here. We welcome people who aren't Jewish into our shul. Great. I understand that at least present-day non-Jews are permitted to observe all halakhot. Is this accurate? So it appears. You know, there's no reason why not. I, I understand there are certain things that were prohibited back in the day, whether Shabbat observance or even study of the Torah is prohibited according to some rabbinic opinions. But all the same, I don't, I don't know what, if every legal decisor rules that way, but it's certainly not something to worry about. In other words, there definitely are people who can be welcomed, welcome them to observe halakha, they so choose. And regardless, of course, Jews can't enforce what non-Jews do in this situation. If somebody, non-Jew chooses to keep Shabbat, there's nobody who's going to go after him with the Jewish police. Okay, so until now we've discussed, everybody accepts God, welcome to the temple. Some people felt discrimination, but they're welcome anyway. They shouldn't feel discriminated against. Uh, the possibility of non-Jews serving as priests in the temple and the mitigation factor of, no, 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 that's not what it meant. Either Jews will serve as priests or non-Jews will serve in attending roles. Then we talked about Isaiah 19, that all nations of the world can become chosen again. So far, so good. And this brings us to source number 10. This land you shall divide for yourselves among the tribes of Israel. You shall allot it as a heritage for yourselves and for the strangers who reside among you you who have begotten children among you. You shall treat them as Israelite citizens. They shall receive allotment along with you among the tribes of Israel. You shall give the stranger an allotment within the tribe where he resides, declares the Lord God. So here what's interesting is that we mentioned this in passing last week. Now we can talk about it more. Uh, the simple reading of this text is that non-Jews living in the land of Israel will be given land in the future. And that's remarkable. Because in Joshua's time, that's not what happened. In Joshua's time, the entire land was distributed to the people of Israel, all 12 tribes. And if non-Jews married into that, they, excuse me, if non-Jews lived in Israel, they didn't get land. They could live there. They were the resident alien, but that's what makes them an alien. So 
And here the prophet Ezekiel is saying that in the future, all of a sudden, non-Jews living in Israel, living a decent life, also will get land, which is what it seems to be. That actually is what he seems to be saying, which on some level would make them not so much aliens, right? All of a sudden they have, and they're landowners. They become very much part of the society on a much more fundamental level. Now here, it's interesting. There's no law in the Torah outlawing non-Jews from owning land in the land of Israel. There's no law in the Torah like that at all. The reality from the time of Joshua was that, that Joshua conquered the land from the Canaanites and distributed whatever he conquered to the people of Israel. And then what plugs in is the law of the land from the Torah, the Jubilee year, that all of that land reverts back to the original families every 50 years. So that you have. But there's no prohibition specifically of non-Jews owning land. It just didn't happen in, that, in Israel society. So Ezekiel here is saying that in the future, that won't be so. In the future, the map of Israel will be different and non-Jews will inherit land as well. But many, many, many traditional commentators don't like that reading. They find it very uncomfortable. And so let's just look at two approaches, but first we have to get over to Myron. Okay, Myron. Oh, you have your hand up. You have your hand up on my screen. So that's why I'm- Yeah, I'm unable to type. I'm sorry. Um, is it possible that Yechezko here in, in this, in this uh, um, source 10 is saying that there will be, you know, there'll be normal nachalot for the Jewish people, but there'll be land set aside for the resident aliens or however we're going to translate geirim at this level. Very good. So there are two things at stake, riding on exactly your question. The prophet Ezekiel in this passage, not in the one that we have in front of us, but in the chapter, actually redraws the map of Israel. Rather than reverting back to the Joshua borders and the Joshua distribution, he says that in the future, when the Jews return to their land, all 12 tribes will return and they will all live west of the Jordan River. And so he redistributes that part of the land. Nobody will live east of the Jordan anymore, unlike the two and a half tribes that had made a deal with Moshe back in the day. So he's already undoing the original traditional map in favor of this new distribution. So, that, so with that comes the corollary that we're talking about, which is so non-Jews living in Israel will simply be able to dwell among those 12 tribal inheritances. Right? It's not land set aside outside of the Joshua borders because we're not dealing with Joshua anymore. That's the way that it seems. However, many commentators, classical commentators, understand that even in the future, non-Jews won't be able to be landowners in Israel, even though there's no prohibition from that. And they either reinterpret Ezekiel as referring to uh, atonement or burial rather than inheritance. Or the much more common approach, which I think you alluded to a moment ago, Myron, starting with, starting with Rashi, but a long line of commentators, assume that the word gerim here refers to converts, actual born Jews, uh, excuse me, people who converted to actual Judaism rather than the resident alien. So that's still an innovation. The idea that converts could receive land, even though they're outside of the 12 born tribes, <coughs> still is different from the time of Joshua, but it's at least full Jews now as opposed to resident aliens. But all the same, the plain sense of the text is we're dealing with resident aliens here and that they are much more welcome fully integrated into Israel's ideal society down the road. Okay, now hold on one second. <coughs> Excuse me. Time for another water break. In the Yovel year, what happens to land owned by non-Jews? Nothing really. The land that was owned by non-Jews to begin with, which the Israelites never, if they didn't dispossess the Canaanites, then that was it. That land belonged to the landowners and nothing happened during the Jubilee year. Should non-Jews be called to Bima Aliyah for blessings of the Torah reading decline? Oh, so that's just a technical question. If they're in a synagogue, they should not be called, right? In other words, that obligation is on Jews and Halakha wouldn't, wouldn't call a non-Jew to the Torah itself. So if they don't say anything, then they don't say anything. And usually the Gabai, whoever's in charge of these things, they don't ask too many questions. It happened once, I remember when I was a rabbi of a synagogue, and somebody who was studying to convert, but I, I was meeting him for the first time. I went over to him and he was wearing talit and tefillin and everything. And I asked him if he's a Kohen. So he said, yes. So I said, great, let's call him, we're gonna call you Kohen. So we called him up Kohen. 
and I chatted with him after Tefillah just to welcome him to the synagogue, to show him around. It turns out that he just didn't speak a lot of English and fully did not understand my question at all. And it turns out he was non-Jewish altogether. So he wasn't a Kohen nor, nor a Jew, but he still got to be a Kohen that day. And so, but, but that's fine. In other words, we didn't do anything wrong. I acted in good faith thinking that his answer was true and we presume it to be true. We don't assume that he's coming in and lying just to make a sham of the process. It turns out that it was just a pure, simple misunderstanding. He didn't understand a word I was saying. Okay, so, so, so be it. And so I, I, got a good, I got a good smile out of that one. But in principle, if the person knows that, then they should, they should decline the aliyah, yeah? We know that even in the time of Joshua, he did not conquer all of the land. What about that unconquered land? So again, that belonged to the very good question. Is that, that land still was Canaanite land and never was under the Jubilee laws. Joshua would have liked it, had, and he exhorted the people before he died, make sure you dispossess the rest of the Canaanites, inherit their land, and become the rulers of it, in which case it would have gone to those respective tribes. Right? But the parts that remained in Canaanite hands, there's no Jubilee law for them. The Canaanites live there. You can't go to them and say, Okay, it's now, it now belongs to the tribe of Menashe or to Don, Don or whoever, because the Canaanites would say, get lost, it belongs to us. So in practice, that, I don't know what happened in, in the biblical period, but as long as there were Canaanites living in their land, they were simply Canaanite lands. They, didn't, they were not under the law of the land. Okay, now we move on to what sounded to me like one of the most remarkable prophecies in the whole Bible. I mean, the ones that we've seen so far are pretty good. You have at least a suggestion that non-Jews may serve in the temple as Kohanim, even though traditional commentary deflects that reading. We have a reading that non-Jews living in Israel in the future will inherit land, which is amazing, because again, in the Torah and in the book of Joshua, that was not the reality. It's not a law, but it was simply not the reality, but this seems to be a new reality for the future. And then you have this one by the prophet Joel. We don't know when Joel lived. There's a huge debate uh, within classical commentary and modern scholarship, when exactly Joel lived. It's an undated book, but all the same, Joel says that after that, referring to there was a locust plague in his time, whenever that was, and when that locust plague is over, sometime after that, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. I will even pour out my spirit upon male and female slaves in those days. At least the first read of that is that in this future, this idealized future, everybody will be a prophet. That's cool. That's even better than what Moshe dreamed about in his day. And Moshe dreamed that all of Israel should be prophets. This is even better than that. It sounds like in the future, everybody gets to be a prophet. Jew, non-Jew. That's what it sounds like, on all flesh. Right? So that's pretty cool. If, if that is what he's saying, this is by far a standalone prophecy in the whole Bible. There's nothing, there is nothing quite like this. Uh, most commentators, and for that matter, most modern scholars disagree with that reading for the simple, simple reason that going back to our pronoun lessons, if you look at verse one again, after that, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. The prophet Joel wasn't talking to the world. He was talking to the people of Israel. So when you say your sons and daughters, your old people, that means you, the people of Israel. And that's how Ibn Ezra and Radak and most contemporary scholars also understand the verse, that we're not dealing with universal prophecy, rather we're dealing with Jews will prophesy. Okay, and if that, if that is the right reading, that, then that prophecy is Joel's prophecy is very much like the prophecy of Ezekiel in source number 12. I will never again hide my face from them, for I will pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. Here there's no ambiguity. Here it refers to prophecy or some kind of divine spirit onto the people of Israel in the future, and there's no reference to non-Jews. And so Ibn Ezra, Radak, and many contemporary scholarship based on the pronouns in, in, in source 11, understand that your sons and daughters refers to you equals Israel. Okay, so that's, that's that piece. Uh, Abar Benel rereads source 11 in verse 1. He says that, no, the prophecy actually addresses two different people. After that, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Abar Benel understands that all flesh means all people. But it means that all people will be inspired to serve God. And he even quotes our source number 1 from the prophet Svanya. He says that all people will speak a pure language, pure speech. And that means that everybody will be God-fearing. 
And then Jews will prophesy. Abar Benel understands your sons and daughters the way Ibn Ezra and Radak understand it, that your sons and daughters will prophes shall prophesy. That means that Jews will prophesy. The only Jews will get full prophecy, but non-Jews will be inspired by God and will serve God properly. That's how he understands this passage. So the truth is, I, I don't find the second reading compelling, but even Ezra and Radak seem to be correct, that Joel is saying that in the future, Israel will have prophecy. But it's important to note uh, that fundamentally speaking, at least, all people have access to prophecy. Prophetic revelation is certainly not limited to the people of Israel. And we have this wonderful Midrash in source number 13 that says very clearly what seems to be the biblical model, which is, I call to witness, again, source 13, the last source on our pages, I call to witness the heavens and earth, that whether a Gentile or Jew, man or woman, servant or maidservant, all is according to one's actions. And to that degree, divine inspiration rests on, upon him. That seems to be correct, that prophecy is not something that's Jewish or non-Jewish. It's that one who has an intimate relationship with God can have all of this access to God. So let's summarize. Let's summarize the various passages that we've done, and then we'll have a few more minutes for Q&A, and then we'll wrap it up. The prophet Svanya understands that in the future, Jew and non-Jew will serve God properly and have a human unity through that context. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 2 talks about how all people will have access to the temple, which is simply rooted into King Solomon's dedication prayer when he opened the temple in the first place. The third source, Isaiah 56, talks about already in the biblical period discrimination, that there were some Jews who definitely discriminated against non-Jews who wanted to serve in the temple, and they felt excluded. And so the prophecy has to come along and teach, no, that's not the vision that we have. Everybody who serves God is welcome to the temple, period. And they should always feel included, that they have, God's, they have God's support and love. The most interesting source to me, which might fly in the face of halakha, actual Jewish law, is Isaiah chapter 66, where, where non-Jews will bring Jews from the exile to the land of Israel. And then from them, God will accept some as kohanim. And the question is, who's the them? So according to Rashi, it just means from the Kohanim, from the Jews who are brought back of priestly stock, they will serve in the temple and God will accept their repentance. According to Rabbi Joseph Kimchi, these not, it refers to the non-Jews and that they will serve in the temple in an attending role. And then finally, you have Amos Chacham who understands that it's a metaphor. God will consider non-Jews who serve in the temple as though they are priests serving in the temple, not that they actually will serve in the temple. And the last verse... In what source? I, I, need, I need help. In the last verse, is Shmirat Shabbat expected? Two or just the seven laws of Noah? It's, it's unclear. In, in the Bible, in the Torah Shabbat, in the written law, it sounds like the resident alien is obligated to keep Shabbat. We discussed that last week. And that's what seems to be over here. Oh, and Eliyah Rabbi, I, don't, I have no idea how Shmirat Shabbat fits into that passage. It just sounds like God-fearing people who fit whatever criteria God has will be able to receive prophecy. I don't know, I don't know how, how Shabbat observance figures into that source. Okay, so we talked about Isaiah 66 and, and what role non-Jews might have in the future temple where the simple reading might yield the conclusion that they may serve as priests, but typically speaking, our classical commentaries don't think that this prophecy is violating what the Torah says, which is that only people from the family of Aaron may serve as actual priests and regular Jews like me or non-Jews may serve in the temple, but not as, not as priests. Uh, then you have Isaiah chapter 19, that we saw that other nations of the world, if they serve God properly, can become chosen people also. There was some resistance within our tradition, including by Rashi, one of our greatest of the commentaries. But all the same, the predominant reading of the text is that God accepts non-Jews who are righteous as chosen people as well. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 47, the simple reading is that non-Jews living in Israel, the resident alien, in the future will actually get land alongside with born Jews, which is amazing. That again, has no precedent in the first temple period, but all the same, it doesn't violate any law. We then have Joel chapter three, where at least the first reading sounded like everybody will prophesy in the future. It turns out to probably not be correct. It sounds like this prophecy is exclusively about Israel. It doesn't exclude non-Jews. It's just not about non-Jews. But all the same, it's specifically about the people of Israel. But I quoted Eliyar Rabbah just to say that that position, you know, what the first reading seemed to be, in fact, is on the books as a legitimate and, in fact, a very realistic perspective on who should be able to attain prophecy. 
On that happy note, let's go over to the traffic. Zechariah writes that there won't be Canaanites in the house of Hashem. How do we understand that non-Jews may serve as Kohanim and Levites in these prophecies? So here it depends what Kanaani means. I mean, there, there, are di- there, are, there are different types of non-Jew within Tanakh, right? Some are immoral. And those are the ones who don't belong in the temple or they're pagans. They also don't belong in the temple. And there are some who are good and moral and, and monotheists. Those are people who are more than welcome to serve in the temple all the time. So presumably Zechariah is talking about a different group of people who are unfit for one reason or another to serve in the temple. Whereas the prophet Isaiah and others very much understand that we're dealing with at least the good ones may serve in the temple. So I think that that's what's going on between the different prophecies. It seems that anyone who discriminates against non-Jews, anyone should not have access to the temple. I feel the same way, but it doesn't, the law isn't that, but all the same, the prophets are definitely very sensitive to this anti-discriminatory process that you have those who've discriminated and the prophets want to undo that. They don't want, they don't want this type of discrimination. I don't know that they should be barred, even though morally I agree with you that people running the temple should be following God's rules rather than some discriminatory policy that goes beyond what God wanted. When was the last source written? Not sure. I mean, typically Eli Arabi, I think, is dated to around the ninth century CE. But that all being said, it contains many teachings that may be much older than that. Any Midrashic collection fits that general, fits that general bill. So in this shiur, I was hoping to map out at least some parameters on how the prophets understand the ideal messianic future. So there still will be some divisions between Jew and non-Jew, but not in term, nothing fundamental. The whole idea is that Jew and non-Jew will serve as priest, a priestly nation and chosen nations of the world who will all serve God in the temple with the united humanity, not by all becoming Jewish, but rather all serving God with one heart and, and, and as moral human beings. So I hope that this three-part series, and just to, to wrap it all up, out, I mean, it's only an outline, but it's, hopefully it outlines some of the core values from the Bible itself. Uh, just to state one rabbinic debate, which goes far beyond the biblical evidence, but it's an important one that, that afflicts our community today also, is that, you know, somebody who deals with this a lot is Professor Menachem Kellner. He's not the problem. He is awesome. Professor Menachem Kellner taught Jewish thought at Haifa University for many, many years, now teaches at the Shalem, the Shalem College in Jerusalem. He's written extensively on this topic, and we correspond about it all the time and about other things, too. Uh, Many strands of Jewish thought starting in the medieval period believed that in some form or another, Jews are superior to non-Jews. They're born superior. They have a superior soul. But that and the corollaries that includes Rabbi Yudha Halevi in the Kuzari, that includes the great mystical text called the Zohar, that includes many later thinkers who were influenced by one or both of those two sources. Or that in some form or another, there's an actual metaphysical difference between Jew and non Jew. What that means is that somebody who converts to Judaism is still not equal to a born Jew because they, their soul is not, is not as good. Right? So even if they convert, they're welcome to the Jewish people but they're, they're simply not the same. And likewise, this point of view prohi- prohibits, doesn't allow for the possibility that non-Jews can receive prophecy. Okay? So that, again, Rabbi Yudah Levi, Zohar, and those who were influenced by one or both of those teachings adopt that sort of view. Very emphatically against all of that was Rambam and those who follow him, Maimonides, who said there's, the Tanakh doesn't say any of these things. There's no record whatsoever of some metaphysical difference between Jew and non-Jew. We're all from the same family. And he also stresses that in some sense, the people of Israel also are converts to the religion, starting with Abraham, right? It's not that they were fundamentally some different super race or whatever. They also accepted God just first, but all the same, there was a conversion as a nation of the people of Israel at that point. And that's why Rambam very emphatically maintained that a convert to Judaism is in fact equal to a born Jew. There's no difference. They're, they both have accepted Judaism and all of its religious moral teachings. So they totally can do that. And then the other side is, what is the other side? Oh yeah, that Jews and non-Jews can receive prophecy. Rambam had no issue with that because the Bible has no issue with that. God can choose to give prophecy to anybody whom God sees fit. There's no sense whatsoever of God can only give it to Jews because only Jews are fit to receive prophecy. There's no such thing as that. Whoever is fit, it's a small group of people anyway, but anybody who is fit should be able to receive prophecy. And that was Rambam's view very emphatically. Okay. 
Uh, also, the Bhavajit has extra soul. That's all based on the Zohar teaching that I was mentioning. Within the mystical tradition, there's definitely a difference. Look, the Yiddish and the Shama, right? The idea of a Jewish soul. That is a metaphysical concept from Kabbalistic teachings, and one that definitely affects many in the Jewish community today, that, that colors their perception of how the world goes. All I can say, not as a medieval philosopher, but as, as a student of the Bible and the prophets, uh, there's no trace whatsoever of a fundamental difference between Jew and non-Jew. It all has to do with the laws. That since the people of Israel accepted God, God gave a special covenant to the people of Israel. And that's how Rambam frames it. Rambam happens to be fully in sync with the biblical picture in this case. And again, just to bring those other points home, that's why prophecy is available to anybody. And that's why all the world will be redeemed in the future. And that's why a convert to Judaism is fully equal to somebody who was born Jewish. There's simply no distinction whatsoever between the two, precisely because there's no difference metaphysically between Jew and non-Jew, which is exactly the biblical view. So in the world that we live in, we at the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals think that there's a critical obligation to study specifically these relevant topics. It's of such great importance of every, in every age, but it's of great importance today too. To just remind us of what, what we stand for, and then God willing to model that behavior and attitude toward the rest of the world so that ultimately one day these messianic visions that we talked about today can start to become more and more of a reality. On that happy note, I wanna thank all of you for, for joining. This has been quite an amazing series, and I look forward to doing more series with the Institute. I want to thank all of you for your communication, for being part of this, and it's amazing that we just started it a couple of weeks ago, and 140 people signed on, which is great. Not everybody was on every single one, but a total of 140 people have participated in our series, and God willing, we'll be able to promote future classes and series better. I want to give a special thank you to all of you who are members and supporters of the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals, because honestly, that's what makes it all possible. If you're not yet a part of our work, please do join us. We invite you to just visit our website, which is jewishideas.org. And it's on the source sheets also. On any of my source sheets, you'll find our web address. And you could learn more. Sorry, that's a private thing. So let's try to make it public. And I look forward to learning with you in the very near future. We will, of course, communicate with that through our email. So thank you so much again. Have a wonderful rest of summer. And most importantly, be well. I look forward to learning with you in the near future. Take care. Thank you, Yasha Kaur, Rabbi Angel. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. It's okay, honey. Shana Tova. Shana Tova, everybody. Shana Tova.